Amen. Good morning. Y'all hear me okay? Well, I want to appreciate everybody for the songs. And, uh, man, that's what it's all about, using our talents for the Lord. So appreciate each and every one of you, uh, Susie, Brother Dick, and Megan, and the kids for singing. What a blessing. Well, this morning, before I get started, uh, a few announcements and, and prayer needs. As you can see, uh, I'm kind of missing a few this morning. My wife, Rachel, is home recovering from gallbladder surgery. She had her gallbladder removed on Tuesday. And uh, she thought she was going to be superwoman and be bounced back uh, here in a few days. But she's still a little stiff and sore, so I'd ask for you to pray for her this morning. And that she'd be back up on her feet moving here in the next few days. Because uh, I'm not good at being Mr. Mom sometimes. So <laughs> I need, need your prayers. But, um, she's doing fine, but just a little stiff and sore, so she decided to stay home this morning. Um, also, I want you to be praying for me today at 2 o'clock. I have a funeral service. Uh, Sister Janet Shank. Uh, we prayed for her last week. She passed away on Monday. Her funeral is at 2 o'clock today uh, at Beans Chapel. So be praying for that, praying that the Lord can use that funeral service in a mighty way to reach uh, reach that family. So, uh, Also on the prayer list, there's others that have lost loved ones. Um, I will add that we had uh, Chris Hankel on the prayer list, and uh, he passed away last night as well. He had fought a long fight, a uh, long, hard fight with cancer. I've known him and his family for a long time, and we certainly send our prayers out. Uh, to them as well. So, does anybody else have any other prayer needs this morning they want to mention? Uh, Robbie Goodman had a major surgery. Okay. All right. We'll remember him. Lift him up. And we got some traveling through back here in the back. The family of Deanna Roberts. Deanna Roberts family. All right. We'll remember that family as well for bereavement. And Ronnie Good. I think he had surgery on Wednesday. Okay. Ronnie Good. We'll lift him up. Remember him this morning. So. Anybody Good. else? Joe Burner. Yep, continue praying for, for Joe Burner. Uh, he's had a time. He's been back and forth in and out of the hospital from Winchester back to Luray, back to Winchester, in ICU and out of ICU. Um, talked to Barbara yesterday, and he's back in a regular room. Um, and talked to him this morning. He said he's having a pretty good day so far. So pray that the things will get straightened out with Brother Joe. And uh, pray for his wife, Barbara, too, as she's dealing with all that as well. So. Um, this morning, uh, if you would turn your Bibles to um, Luke chapter number 22, Luke 22, I want to preach to you a message this morning called, What Does It Look Like? What Does It Look Like? I'm going to be reading verses 54 through 71, Luke 22, verse 54 through 71. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophecy, who is that smote thee? And many other things blasphemy spake against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him to their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Yea, say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard out of his own mouth. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you, Lord, and praise you for this beautiful day you've given us. Father, this is the day that you've made, and you've instructed us, Lord, to rejoice and be glad in it. 
We thank the Lord for an opportunity and privilege that we have to come to your house, Lord, to, to lift praises to you, Lord, as you so rightly deserve. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And I pray, Lord, today as we go through this message, Lord, that the focus is not on me, Lord, that it's on you. It's on your, your precious word and your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, you give me the words to, to speak to these people today, that there be a need here, Lord, that you would fulfill that need. And I pray more importantly, Lord, there be one here that's lost, that don't know Christ as their Savior. Lord, today would be a great day for them to get saved. Father, we mentioned many names here this morning that, uh, Lord, need your prayers. Uh, they, 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 they have a need from you, and you instruct us, Lord, to, to bring those needs and those petitions to you. And I just pray, Lord, that your will would be done in each and every situation for those that are sick those that are recovering from surgery, those that have lost loved ones. And, Lord, those that wanted to be here this morning but just couldn't make it, we just pray, Lord, that you'd send a blessing their way as well. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done through the uh, reading of your word, through the songs, and through the prayer requests. And we look forward to your blessing the rest of this service. We'll turn it over to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, the title of this message I have is, What Does It Look Like? And uh, as I was... Preparing for this message and preparing for the funeral today at 2 o'clock, uh, it led me to that title. And I hope by the time the end of the service, you'll kind of see where I'm going with that. Uh, but here we see the story of Peter. And we touched briefly on Peter a little bit this morning in, in our Sunday school lesson. And uh, Peter is used uh, in many uh, messages uh, today throughout the world as, as God's word is preached. I'm sure there's thousands of messages that are being pre preached on Peter. And there's a wealth of things that we could use about Peter. And sometimes we focus on some of the good things that he's done, and we focus sometimes on some of the bad things. We might look at this story, how he denied the Lord, and, and focus on it as a bad thing. But I want to turn today and look to see how you know, we can ask ourselves that question, what, what does it look like? But here, uh, they had gathered uh, in the upper room for the Last Supper, and uh, our Lord and Savior had prophesied that Peter would deny him three times. And we see through the progression of the story here that it, it happened. And immediately that third time that he denied our Lord, the cock crew, uh, fulfilling what the Lord had said. And uh, it just goes to show us all throughout God's word that he reaffirms what he said. Uh, there's only one thing that has not happened uh, in this word that, that he said would, and that is his return. And I can tell you that it is, it's going to happen. If he said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And I pray today that all of us are looking for that. But here we see a man who was the head of the disciples. He was the, the one that Jesus had turned to, the one he had put uh, a little extra uh, power to him or some uh, support of his group of disciples. Yet we see in this time here uh, that he has denied our Lord. Uh, when I was preparing for this funeral this week, uh, I, I've known that family for quite a few years, and uh, but I've only known them in their later years, I would say in their golden years. Many of you may be here today enjoying your golden years. Some of you will probably tell me that it's not so golden. That's what people tell me. I don't know. I haven't got there yet. But that's how I remember them and how I know them. But looking and preparing for that, I thought I did not know many of the things that they had done. I, I didn't see it. I couldn't tell what their life looked like 50 years ago because I wasn't here to see it. But it really opened my eyes up, and I thought about some things that we need to look at as what should it look like. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is the church. What does the church look like? What does the church look like? If I ask you that question, what does the church look like? If you would begin to describe, probably your, your mind would go immediately to this church building. You would say, well, the church is it's a white frame structure. It has a steeple. It has a nice paved parking lot. Uh, it's it's well kept up. It's a it's a beautiful facility, um, but really that's not what the church is. We see here later on. I'll, I'll go back to another verse about Peter, in one of his better moments, where Christ said that upon this rock, referring to Peter, that he would build the church. The church itself is a building. It's a structure. It's really no different than the house that sits next door. It's really no different than the gas station down the road. I'm not making light of it because I feel like this is where God has put us to worship. And it is holy ground. We should treat it that way because we have gathered here to seek God. And that's why God's here because we're seeking him. We could gather in the parking lot. Many churches in our community are still gathering in their parking lots. I feel for them this morning because they probably had a crisp start uh, this morning for those outside services. 
but we could gather in the parking lot and still meet with God. It could still be a holy place. So when we ask what does the church look like, it's not the building. Uh, there was a pastor in Dallas, Texas, and he was concerned about his church. Uh, I firmly believe that the, that the focus of any church should be Jesus Christ. It should be the love of Christ in our heart and in our life, and people should look at the church and be able to see a reflection of Christ in the church and within the people. But this pastor in Dallas, Texas, he was concerned about his church because they felt they weren't quite compassionate enough. They weren't quite giving enough, not with finances, but with just being a servant of the Lord, being his hands and being his feet. So he decided one Sunday he was going to try to fool his congregation. He went down to the thrift store and he had bought an old raggedy pair of pants and some shoes and an old worn out jacket and a hat and he put it on. And before church started, he sat outside on the porch steps. He just went outside. He would just sit there on the porch watching everybody in his congregation go by. All of them went by. All of them went in. Not a single one of them stopped to invite the man into the building. Not a single one of them stopped to ask the man if he needed anything. So they were all sitting inside their church. Their service was getting ready to start, and they were looking around. The preacher's nowhere to be found. He's nowhere to be found. And then here the door opens up at the back of the church, and here he comes. He comes walking up through there, and he starts taking off his hat and his jacket. And the congregation realizes that it was their preacher sitting outside on the porch. He proved the point. I'd say he hit home what, it, what he was doing. That was more effective than any message he could ever do. But he was concerned about his church. He was concerned about the people in his church, wanting them to show these things. I think when we look at the church, what we should see, what the church should look like, should be unity. Unity should be first and foremost. Now, I spoke about this last Sunday night. Unity does not mean that we yoke ourselves with other people who don't believe the word of God, who don't believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We can't, we can't have unity with people who disagree with what the word of God says. We can have unity with other churches, other denominations who preach the word of God, who may not do it exactly the way we do it, who may not worship the exact same way that we do here at Forward for Christ or for other churches, but we have to have unity. But what I'm referring about unity here is not really that. It's unity amongst ourselves. We must be yoked together in one mind, in one accord, to have that, that desire that when people look at our church, when they say, what does your church look like? That they can say, well, that's a, that's a group of unified believers that, that love the Lord, and they show off Christ in all that they do. We have to be unified. Does that mean that I'm going to root for the same football team that Brother Mike does? No, it does not. Does that mean I'm going to drive the same car as Norma? No, it does not. Does it mean that we're going to agree on every little single issue? It does not. But what it means is that we have to be unified together, that Christ must be at the center of all we do. And everybody that sees our church and sees this place, don't just look at a building. Don't just look at a, a paved parking lot that they see Christ. We must be able to be able to see love. We must be able to see love. Now that preacher who sat on the porch steps as all of his congregation went by, if it'd be me, I would feel a little bit, I'd be upset because I feel like I'm not doing my job. I'm not doing what God would have me to do. If not, a single person would feel the need to stop and ask me a question. We don't have to be the same color of skin. We don't have to be the same race. We don't have to work at the same place. We don't have to do anything to love one another. Now we have a special love and a special bond for the family that the Lord has given to each and every one of us. When I agreed to accept this position at the church, I told Mike and the committee, I said, look, I said, you're not only getting me, you're getting my family. And this is how I feel. You might disagree with me, but, but the Lord comes first in my life. Second is the family, and now third will be this church and this congregation. But the Lord has first given me salvation, and I'm thankful for that. Then he blessed me with my family, and now he's blessed me with this beautiful, wonderful church family. But we must be able to show that love, and we must have compassion. Compassion makes a difference. When we, uh, that old saying, it goes back to actions speak louder than words. I can get up here, and I can preach, and I can preach, and I can stand on my head. But I could go out and do one act of kindness that the Lord would have us to do, and that could be more effective than anything that we can say. Now, it's important that we preach the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. 
but we must be able to show compassion. And then we must be a church of grace, a church of grace. The, the Lord give us the greatest example of grace with forgiveness. We've been talking about that with Joseph and his brothers in Sunday school. If you're missing out, if you have time, come on in for Sunday school. Brother Mike's doing a great job with Sunday school. It's a rich uh, time of study to get into God's word. And we've been talking about Joseph and how he was betrayed by his family and betrayed by his brothers. But it gives that ultimate uh, act of grace, of forgiveness, how he forgave his brothers and he restored them. And that's exactly what God did for us. One of my favorite verses, and you'll probably hear me say that over, you think, how many favorite verses does he have? Because all of them are my favorite. I asked the family of Janet Shank, I said, is there a verse that you want me to read that Janet loved? And they said, well, no, I can't really think of anything. Why? Because she loved the whole word of God. The whole word of God. She didn't have a particular favorite. She loved it all. And that's the way we could be. One of my favorite is that God commended his love towards us, meaning that he demonstrated it. He had compassion. He showed it to us that even while we were yet sinners, even while we were doing things that makes God sick to his stomach, makes him offended, even while he were doing that, he loved us enough that he sent his son to die for us. Grace. If God can do that for us, we can have grace and forgive our brothers and our sisters who may have done something wrong against us, who may have done something that you just don't quite agree with us. We need to be a church that shows grace. So I need to ask you a question this morning. If they ask you, what does your church look like? What's your answer going to be? Is it going to be over there on Hinton Road on the corner of Collins Avenue and Hinton Road? we got a beautiful little church, a nice sanctuary. Come inside. Are, we going to, are you going to answer them and say it looks like Christ? It looks like the Lord? I pray that that's what we can do, that we can be that, that we can be the hands and feet of Christ. Later on here, uh, in Peter, I want you to turn to Matthew 16. We're going to see a little bit different look at Peter. Matthew 16. I'll go ahead and read to you verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now here we see a, a little bit better image of Peter. Here he immediately identifies on who Christ is. They're, they're, the disciples are asking him, who are you? Some say you're a prophet. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And he looks at them, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? Who do you think I look like? And he answers that question. It gives us that forefront on what our church is built upon. When he said, thou art the son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. And he immediately identified. That's a far cry from when he denied our Lord. When he was in his weakest hour and he denied the Lord, here he identifies in the ark the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him and he said that. He said, Thou art, uh, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. He said, For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, he said, But my Father which is in heaven. And he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now he literally did not mean that he was going to build the church upon Peter. What he meant was he was going to build his church on men like Peter. He was going to use men like Peter, like his disciples, who put Christ at the forefront to be the cornerstone of the church. So now we've identified, we know what the church should look like. I pray that that's what our church looks like. But when we get inside of now this structure and this building of what we call a church, we see a Christian. So I ask you that question now. We've identified what does the church look like or what should the church look like. What does a Christian look like? I could, I could rewind and I could turn my notes back over in my sermon and go through those same four points that I pointed out of what the church should look like. Because without the people inside of the church being unified, showing love, showing compassion, and showing grace, 
then we cannot be what God would have us to be. Peter has identified himself with Christ, and then more importantly, after he did that, Christ identified himself with Peter. He said, you are one of mine. And that's what truly is. There could be many definitions of Christ, a believer, a believer in the Lord. Many people say that. Uh, talk to me after the service. And that's a wide, that's a big, uh, varying definition there. Because look, the Bible tells me that, that the devil, that Satan believed and he trembled. So just because we believe doesn't necessarily mean that we're a Christian. I believe this, that it is this, that we must show faith. Christians must show our faith. That's how we can be identified as being one of Christ when we show faith. Hebrews uh, chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So can I tell you what faith looks like? I can't do it. The Bible tells me here I, I can't do it. But it says it is the evidence of things hoped for. To me, when I look out to each and every one of you, and as I get to know you better, I'll, I'll hopefully be able to, to pray with you in your darkest times. Hopefully I'll be there for you in those tough times. And I can look and see how people respond in those tough times, in those darkest hours of their life, as to how, well, that's what faith is. And faith for you may be different than what faith is for me. Here, I've referred to two of these stories, two of these situations about Peter, and one of them was when he was in a weak area of his life. I don't want to jump ahead in my message because I'm going to touch on that here in just a minute. But faith is this. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then Romans 10, 17 says this. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So look, we've got to be able to present the word of God. That's why the church is so important. That's why I started out with the church and not with the Christians, not with you and I that are sitting inside this church building today because we have to have the church. We have to have that avenue to be able for people to hear the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. Now, it's not just my responsibility. It's not just the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's not the deacon's responsibility. It's not the ones having children's church responsibility. It's each and every one of us who have that faith, that evidence of things that we can't see, it's left up to each and every one of us to be the hands and feet, to be the mouth of the Lord, to present his word. Listen, I'm thankful that this church has decided that the doors will be open. And this morning we're missing some people. We got some people traveling. I've got some family out. I know some other people that are not feeling well. And I'm telling you, before long we're going to be here and we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do about the social distancing and things. And that's a good situation for us to be in. Keep praying. I said earlier, don't, don't look around and say, well, we're almost full at half capacity. We'll, make, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. Keep inviting your family and your friends to come to church. But it's important that we have this mechanism. And I, I, I applaud the churches that have continued on doing outside service. I applaud the churches that have done online services because we have to have that mechanism because faith cometh by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. So this morning as Christians, we need to make sure that we continue to, to show those things that the church should show and that we have that faith and that to, we reach out to one another. When we're in our darkest hour, that's what we're here for. We're here to be unified for each other, to pray for each other, to lift each other up, and to be there for each other. And then I think that if we have those two things identified, we know what the church should look like, we know what the Christian should look like, we know what kind of life that they should live. If you have any other questions about that, the Word of God is filled with the instruction for us on how we should live our life. But after those things, I'm going to give you a word that you hear some about, some of you maybe more than others. But I think, again, we don't truly know what that looks like, and that is revival. We talk about it now. We talk about in these dark times that we're living in, in, these, in this area of pandemic. How people pray that the Lord would, would continue to move, and that, that great things would happen. And literally, as a church, we should be praying for that. We should pray for revival to hit our, our, not just our church, not just our community, our country, our world, that revival would take place. And I do believe that great things would happen. But if I ask you the question, what does it look like? What does revival look like? 
Sit there and think about it for just a minute. Now, I don't know when was the last time you had revival here at the church. I'm not talking about revival, what I'm getting ready to give you a definition of, but like the services. How long has it been? That, but that's what we think about. That's what we think about. We think about the meeting dates. We think about calling an evangelist or a missionary or another pastor. We think about scheduling those dates. We think about maybe putting an ad in the newspaper. We think about putting a sign out here in the yard of the church that we're having revival. And we think just magically because we've scheduled these dates, we've scheduled this speaker, we've scheduled all these things, we've got some special singing coming, that revival is going to take place. But I'm telling you, that's not what it's about. It's not about the, used to be revival was tents. Anybody here remember tent revivals? Mm -hmm. Back here in the back, I see several hands. I'm getting ready today to do uh, that funeral at 2 o'clock for a lady whose husband was saved in the tent revival and called to preach for 55 years of his life to give to the Lord preaching. Uh, that's how revivals used to take place. That's not what it is. It's not the tents. It's not the people. It's not the music. It's not the hard preaching. It's not the rededications of lives. It's not the healing that takes place. Well, that's a, that's a, a touchy subject right now. It's healing. Do I believe the Lord has power to heal? Absolutely, I believe he does. And I believe he's still in the healing business. I believe he's the great physician. And it's not about the salvation decisions that are made. You say, what, is, what are you talking about? They, that's why we have revival. That's why we schedule the meetings. That's why we get the special singers to come so people can rededicate their life to the Lord, so people can get saved, so people can be healed, so we can hear some good, hard preaching. No, they, those are the results of revival. Those are the results of revival. Revival starts by this. I told you my first Sunday that I wouldn't give you my opinion very often because I want to back it up by the Word of God. Now, this is my opinion, but I believe I can back it up from the Word of God. I think revival is allowing God to work in our church, in our hearts, in our lives. Just because we want to schedule a revival meeting doesn't mean it's going to take place. Doesn't mean that these results are going to happen. But what we do if we has if the church is doing what it's supposed to, if it looks like what it's supposed to, if the Christians inside the church look like what they're supposed to, do what we're supposed to do, have faith in God, pray, turn things over to Him, then we will have this thing called revival. We will see people getting saved. We'll see the church building filled up. We'll see people who have been away from the Lord rededicate their life and say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of running away. I want to surrender my life to the Lord and and." and let him use me whatever way he can. That's what revival is. That's what it looks like. It might look different for our church versus other churches. It might look different for one individual in this building. One individual here today could be on fire for the Lord and could be having a great revival in their life that doesn't have anything to do with this church. And I pray that they are. I pray that they're on fire and they're spreading the word of God. The, the real definition, I've looked it up, I don't do this often, but the worldly definition of what revival means is an, an improvement in the condition or strength of something. An improvement. Or is something becoming popular or important? Listen, again. In order for us to have revival, it must be important to us to start with. If it's not important, if we don't have those things in our churches, if we don't have unity and love and grace and compassion, we better be getting it if we want to see the results. If you had it, it might need to be rekindled again. I think about revival. We probably think about this morning. Uh, you could have turned the thermostat up and get a little heat going. Or maybe uh, some of you, I don't know, it's probably way too early for this, I would hope, but to, to get the wood stove going. In order to get that thing fired back up, you know, you might wake up in the morning and be a little bit cold. you got to have some coals there to start with. you got to have something to work with. And that's what the definition of revival is, something that becomes important or popular again. So this morning, I would ask you to search yourself, search your life, search your heart, and say, do I really have that? I'm not trying to plant seeds of doubt into your mind. That's what Satan does. But I know it's important for us to know for sure that we have a desire to serve the Lord in our hearts. And if we don't have that, we need to ask him to give it to us. And then, listen, another thing about revival, I've got it wrote down here. I can show you my notes. I told you you probably can't read my writing. I've got it wrote down three times with exclamation points beside it. And that's talk. Talk, talk, talk is what I said. Talk. That's how revival starts. If you go out here today and you go to the restaurant and order your menu and they say, well, you're dressed up. You've been to church. And they say, well, how was your church service? Well, 
we didn't have many people today. The songs were kind of dry. The preacher, he was long-winded. He just kept on going and going and going. He wouldn't quit. People are, they're not going to want to come. They, somebody want to come to, to hear that? If you said, boy, I had a wonderful day. We was able to get up out of the bed. We was able to come to the house of God. We was able to praise the Lord. They're going to look at that person and say, well, wow. wonder what they're doing over there forward for Christ or whatever church they're in. I'm not telling you to brag about me. Don't brag about me ever. Please don't do it. I'm not worthy of being bragged about. Don't brag about the church. Don't brag about the building. Don't say, well, you know, uh, boy, this is this church. I told Diane's not here today, but I told her one of the first impressions I had was the church was clean when I come in here. It is. And she does a wonderful job cleaning the church. We can't brag about little things like that. We can't brag about our building or about the things here. We need to brag about God. We need to talk about him and say, look, you know, uh, so and so was really struggling and, and they turned their, their need over to the Lord and he answered their prayer somebody else might be going through a very similar situation and they go say well you know if it worked for them why wouldn't it work for me we need to talk if we want to know what revival looks like we've got to know what it should be we've got to know what we want with the results and God will show us that we need to talk we need to talk so I ask you that question here this morning too do you want to see revival? Do you want to see revival in our church? Do you want to see revival in your life, in our community? All of us should say, we do. Amen, we do. I'm going to close with a few things where I think we have a problem with. Why can we not see this? I ask you, what does the church look like? What does a Christian look like? What does revival look like? And maybe you say, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I want you to go back to, uh, to our text this morning where I started out in Luke uh, chapter 22. And we'll look at Peter just one more time. And I'll tell you what a result is here of a three-letter word that's not popular. And that's sin. I told you that I was going to try to give some encouraging messages. But with every encouragement from the Lord, we have to stand firm and preach about things that are not popular. Sin in, in our world, in our life today, is not popular. We must preach about it. In verse number 57, Peter, it says, The woman had asked, let me back up to 56, But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he said to the woman, I know him not. He denied knowing the Lord. And then we see the progression. If we have that thing in our life called sin, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And it says in verse number 58, he goes on and says, After a little while another saw him. And they said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. Not only did he say he did not know who the Lord was, he said he was not a part of them. It keeps getting worse. And then in verse number 60, we jump down. Uh, there was a man in verse number 59 that said that, that he was with this fellow, that he was a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. We can see this because sometimes we can't see what these things look like. It's because we've got blinders on. We don't officially put them on, but the Lord, uh, there's a verse that talks about the God of this world. And that's in uh, Matthew chapter 7. I won't go there for the sake of time, but if you, if you go there and you look, the God of this world is not capitalized in your Bible. It's, it's a little G. I'm going to take you back to elementary school. You know who the God of this world is when, they refer, when he refers to that? Satan. He's the one that puts the blinders on our eyes. He's the one that allows us not to see what these things should look like. And we'll look at Peter one more time. He was, he was weak. He was weary. But he was still trying to follow the Lord. But he got caught up with this wrong crowd. When it says here that they led him away in verse number 54 and they led him to the high priest's house, it said Peter followed, but he was afar off. He was back. But it said they had kindled a fire. Boy, it would feel good this morning outside that they had kindled that fire in the midst of the hall. I'm sure this was a, a, a great big place and it was cold. And then it said after they got that fire going and built it, Peter sat down with them. He sat down with the wrong crowd. If he would have turned away and said, no, these are the enemies of our Lord. These are the people that don't like Christ. These are the people that want to 
to, to kill him. These are the people that's going to crucify him. He had already acknowledged that. He had knew that, that Christ would, be, uh, would have to pay a price of death uh, as he had promised that he would. If he would have left that group and said, no, I'm not going to be a part of it, and said no, that, that he, he sat down with them. It's important for us to not only be the church, be the Christians, but be together. We need to be together and be unified, to lift each other up. Now, I'm not telling you Jesus dined with sinners. He ate with sinners. He talked to them. And uh, I'll tell you this story. I've got just a few more minutes. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my life, uh, and I'm going to confess this is a fault to you. I don't think really it's a sin. I told you last week, confess your sins to the Lord. Confess your faults to one another. It's my third week, so I'm already going to confess a fault to you. <laughs> Back early in my uh, Christian life, uh, I became active in doing things at Antioch and became a deacon. And uh, we had a, still do, they have a vibrant youth program. We were having a uh, event to get the parents from the kids that come on our youth services to church. And man, the place was packed. So one of the ladies in the church, I certainly won't name any names, came to me. She's like, Josh, there's somebody outside smoking a cigarette. They're standing out there in the parking lot and they're smoking. Would you go out there and talk to them? So I thought, well, man, I'm going to be super deacon this morning. I'm going to do my godly duty. I'm going to go out there. And I did. I told the lady, I said, hey, look, you know, this is God's house and you shouldn't be smoking. And I, I completely 100% agree with that. No place for it. But that lady looked at me. She didn't get mad. She didn't fuss at me. She just said, okay, thank you. She turned around and left. It wasn't. I got back inside the church and the Lord just got a hold of my heart and I could just, I could cry about today. And I think, what, what if I was that person's stumbling block? What if they would have took their cigarette and put it out in the church parking lot, but walked inside, heard the word of God, and got saved? Amen. Amen. I couldn't, I looked past what we were there for that day. We were there to be an outreach, to reach those kids that came on a van who have a home life that many of you here today don't have. But I had those blinders on and I was looking at that situation. Now I pray that that lady has since went somewhere and heard the word of God and I pray that, that I'm not that one that was that stumbling block. But after that, I went back to that lady. I said, look, if you've ever got a problem with anybody else, you, you're on your own. I'm a deacon. I'm a servant of the church. And look, if you got a problem here that's not biblical, address, come to me. We'll address it. We'll talk about it. But when we get down to it, we've got to make sure that our love and our compassion is what shows through, that we show through the love of Christ to everybody. Amen. So I'll leave you and I'll ask you, what does our church look like? What is... What, do you, what does your life look like? And then, what would revival look like in this church if we completely surrendered and turned it all over to God? I'm going to pray with you. Susie's going to come to the piano, and then we'll close out our service this morning. Everybody, please bow their head and close your eyes. I pray, Lord, this morning that, uh, first and foremost, that uh, your name has been lifted up and been lifted on high this morning. And I'm thankful, Lord, for your precious word that we can can use your word to, that's just, Lord, it's, it's rich and it's overflowed and it's what we need to, to show us how we should live our life for you. I pray this morning that as we answer these questions, Lord, that we know what we should look like. And I pray, Lord, that that's what we'll do. We'll turn it over to you and say, Lord, we know what we should look like, but without you, we cannot do it. And I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us here will do that. And I pray, Lord, if there be one here today that has never truly accepted Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day that they would say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Just real quickly, is there anybody here this morning that would be in that condition, would say that I'm not sure that I'm saved, that I don't know that I have Christ in my heart as my Lord and my Savior? Anybody? Is there anybody here that would say, I'm not quite sure that I'm looking like what I should look like? that I want to completely surrender it and turn it over to the Lord. Is there anybody here today that would just raise their hand? And I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to pray with you. Anybody like that? Amen. I see the hand. Anybody else? Amen. I see those hands. As I've said always, as we close the, this service out with this closing song, this is your church, this is your service, and this is your altar. If you have a need, please.
come to the altar and pray and turn it over to our Lord. Father, again, I just can't thank you enough for your goodness and for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done here this morning, and we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our last song, number 376. Thank you. 